I'm Tina Beth Pina. During World War II, thousands of incarcerated Japanese Americans became migrant farm workers out east. It was a way to escape the internment camps and start a new chapter in their lives. Walk down any frozen food aisle and you'll find America's favorite cream spinach for sale. Behind this popular dish is a little known Japanese American history that dates back to 1944. Farmer save the world. More beans. Farmer save the world. More milk. More. More rhubarb. More. More spinach. More. Facing a shortage of farm laborers during World War II, Charles Franklin Seabrook enlisted nearly 2,500 Japanese Americans from concentration camps to live and work on his farm and processing plant in Cumberland County, New Jersey. It was part of the U.S. government's War Relocation Authority effort. Families like Theodore Yoshikami didn't have much of a choice, either stay in prison behind barbed wire fence or head east and move from one cramped barrack to another. You had to have a job to, to leave the camp, so he, I think they agreed that they would, um, they would want to go work. It's a place to live, you can get away, and you, know, you, can, you have a job, and so, so many people started to do there, um, go there. And then that's when we decided, my father said fine, so the whole family decided to go. As part of the war effort, Seabrook partnered with Bird's Eye Foods and became the world's largest supplier of frozen foods to the military, earning him the title, the Henry Ford of agriculture. The Yoshikamis were joined by 25 other ethnic groups, including Japanese Peruvian, Estonians, Italians, Caribbeans, and even German prisoners of war. They clocked in 12-hour days, seven days a week, at 50 cents an hour. My mother worked on the line there, which was hard. I think for the parents it was difficult, because the work for women was really hard. They were on the line packing vegetables, you know, all day. My father was fortunate, because he, I guess because he had some managerial skills from his own business, that he was able to work in the stock room, where so people would come in and order certain supplies. My brothers eventually, when they were old enough to work, they worked in the plant too. Some of them picked beans. Mr. Seabrook was terrible. He just, we were all slave labor for them. And cheap labor, you know, nobody got paid really well. Life for the Yoshikamis wasn't always full of hardship and struggles. Her father, George, was an entrepreneur and her mother, Midori, sewed dresses in Hollywood. Then, in 1942, they lost everything and were interned at Tule Lake, California, where Theodora was born and raised. To avoid deportation to Japan, her parents were interrogated and had to prove their allegiance to the United States. Our family pretty much said, you know, we're U.S. citizens, are we going to stay here, and, you know, and a lot of people who were there anyway had never been to Japan, so they were like, what are they asking these questions? We haven't even seen Japan. We don't even know who this emperor is. Giving the right answer meant a second chance and a job out east. The family moved in 1943. We lived on MacArthur Drive, you know, who, who ran the war, basically. And, um, and then there was a Def Jefferson Street. So it was almost like, you know, let remind you that this is America. And yet I think our parents were trying to raise us so that we would become more American. I mean, that was the criticism why the Japanese were put into camps, although that wasn't necessarily true, but they said, oh, the Japanese, they're not learning the language, they're not learning, you know, the, the way the American way is. It's more like what white America is. They tried to make us become more white Americans. That assimilation and enculturation meant attending Seabrook schools and churches. Well, many people became Christians, so we'd all go to the Christian church, and those, those children who were Buddhist, you know, eventually got sort of pressured into becoming Christian. The Yoshikamis adapted to their new life of limited freedom. Yet despite their harsh reality, they did achieve the American dream. Their sons became a doctor, lawyer, and dentist. Theodora formed the first Asian American dance company and became a dancer and choreographer. I used to belong to this, uh, you know, children's theater group. Mm -hmm. Today, Teddy is imparting her knowledge onto the next generation. She's created the East Coast Oral History Project, preserving the memories of our family's internment and life on the farm. It wasn't a great place to live. 
you know, wasn't I, uh, the best place. If we, I think we would never have been there except for the, for the war. I tried to give some of that history of my background and what happens in camp and uh, the fact that I grew up thinking camp was camp, a summer camp, and, and it was a shock when I learned that it was a concentration camp. So, you know, the people just need to realize that such a thing happened here. Seabrook Farms closed its doors in the 1980s, but many of the Japanese-American workers stayed behind in New Jersey. Fourteen years later, residents of Seabrook reopened the Seabrook Educational and Cultural Center to preserve the rich history of its workers in a global bootstrap village. As hundreds of visitors stop by each year, one important lesson could be learned about this part of history. Well, let's just hope it's never repeated, where the Japanese Americans are put into camps. It's just like what's happening now in terms of doing the Muslim registry, and I just hope that really doesn't happen. The government itself is apologized to the Japanese community that this was unjust situation and should never have happened to. So I feel we don't want that to happen ever again. I'm Tina Beth Pina for Asian American Life.